Good morning, church. May the peace of Christ and the blessing of the Holy Spirit be with you all. You are on holy ground. Not sure if you were aware of that or not, but we are going to hear God's word today that we are on holy ground whenever we are willing to pay attention to God, to allow God to get our attention. So holy ground does not exist merely in this sanctuary, but we do pray that this is a holy experience for you today. We welcome you to worship this morning. I especially welcome guests who may be here for the first time. We hope that you feel welcomed as we come together this day. We want to remind you that as we move closer towards September, we are working on our new worship schedule, which will uh, be announced very soon, but uh, suffice it to say that we will be adding uh, re-adding an additional worship opportunity on Sunday mornings, and uh, we anticipate to be worshiping at 9 o'clock and 10.30 with our, our youth and Sunday school programs at 10.30 and our continuation of our 5 o'clock Saturday worship service, and we are looking to begin that on September 11th and 12th. Uh, we continue to pray for all of the opportunities that we can be together and it was holy ground this entire week here because it was a very, very busy place here at the Cargill Church. You'll hear in a few minutes later about our vacation Bible school, but I did want to share a few glimpses on the screen behind me of Youth Mission Works, and that is taking place as we speak. So even at this moment, there are youth and some of their adult team leaders who are downstairs, um, and I think you're going to see it on the next slide. Um, they have... Well, they took to painting our, our theater room, and now they've moved over to another room where we're refurbishing two youth rooms um, to bring them into the 21st century. They looked pretty much like my youth group room would have looked in 1979, so we're doing a little sprucing up down there, and we're having the youth take part in it, so it's really been great. So we ask you to pray for them. They've been here since Friday. Uh, they're pretty tired. <laughs> Uh, but they are doing great work and they're forming Christian community and it is just wonderful to have people back together again. And we pray, we pray for our community's public health that we can remain together as God's people. Welcome again to worship. Let us prepare our hearts to meet with God this morning.
Would you join me in a spirit of prayer? O oh God, we are on holy ground. This place of promises, this place of people seeking God, and of you, O oh God, seeking and saving us. A place of knowing one is hungry and of being fed. This place of grumbling and of silence. This space of solitude and of struggling together. It is to this holy ground that you have drawn us. Here we are. Speak to our hearts. Companion us as you have all who have walked before us, all who have been hungry and have been fed. Turn our mumbling into praise. Surprise us. Bid us in this place of miracles to remember all you have done for us. Amen. We invite you to stand as you are able and sing together. We want to take this opportunity also to welcome those who are worshiping with us live this morning or if you are participating online at any point, we are grateful for the opportunity that God has expanded our sanctuary beyond these walls and indeed the church beyond all walls and we are grateful that we can be together this day. I ought to mention that Pastor Song Min is not with us this morning because she has been involved in the Youth Mission Works and as we speak. She is with the youth this morning, so she sends her greetings, and we are delighted to have Ramona Hohenstein with us this morning, as she will be sharing scripture in just a moment, as well as leading us in prayer a bit later in the worship. Thank you, Ramona, for being with us this morning. And the scripture that Ramona is going to be sharing, you see an excerpt, if you are here in the sanctuary in the back of your worship bulletin. The fullness of the scripture comes from the third chapter of Exodus, so it's actually the first 15 verses. 
If I were to ask you, who are the heroes of the Bible, what are the names that would come to you? Moses. I heard Moses right away. You got it. David? Well, you could keep going, but since you already got it on the first guest, I'm going to stick with Moses, because Moses indeed is God's leader that we are going to check in with this morning, and a prominent figure, perhaps the most prominent figure in the Old Testament. It comes to us in the book of Exodus, which is the second book in the Old Testament. Moses has a fascinating beginning story to his life. And if you want to read more about it, then you can, after worship, go to Exodus chapter 2, because there you'll hear the remarkable story of, through a series of strange events, a Hebrew boy named Moses becomes a prince in the Pharaoh's palace in Egypt and then an outcast in the wilderness. Suffice it to say, it is a remarkable beginning to his life. But as we begin to hear today a message for us about holy ground. We are, gath- we are meeting Moses in an in-between time. He has grown from this remarkable beginning, and he has yet to become the, the leader that we will know him by. He is in a middle space on his life. And this remarkable turn of events comes to us in the third chapter of Exodus. Let us listen for the word of God as Ramona brings it to us this morning. Let us listen for the word of God in the book of Exodus in the third chapter. Moses was keeping the flock of his brother, father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppressed them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? God said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God in this mountain. But Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, And they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, thus you shall say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my title for all generations. God's blessing on the hearing of this word. Thank you, Ramona. 
There's an awful lot there in those 15 verses. I could imagine at least six messages and 12 Bible studies that we could pull out of these few verses. You're only going to get one this morning. Don't be nervous. But it'll get your attention if you pay attention to this passage. God will get your attention with a burning bush. Like moths to a flame, as the saying goes, we are attracted to the elements of nature, particularly when the elements of earth, wind, and fire burst beyond their safe constraints into cataclysms such as earthquakes and fires and storms and burning bushes. And sadly, we know, as many, many thousands of acres in our nation burn as we speak, the enormous power of these natural events. I once lived in an old granary building on a farm. I was renting it. It had been converted into living space. And I lived there for several years, about seven years to be exacted, exact. And the only sounds that you could hear on summer nights were crickets and frogs. It was pretty far away from any other civilization. It was a long way to the next neighbor. It was a pretty unusual place for this city kid to live. But one night, I was awakened by this this horrific sound. It sounded this, this terrifically loud crackle and pop. And there was this sight of this surreal light that was coming through the, the window in the loft where I slept. And I looked out of the window, stumbling there at four in the morning, and there was this horrific sight of flames that were engulfing the barn, which was no more than 75 year, yards from my dwelling place and about 100 yards from the the home of the family that owned the farm. If you've ever been around a fire of that magnitude, it is a completely helpless feeling, and you know the sight of it, the memory of it, and the, the acrid smell of smoke stays with you for days and weeks. I would go into work for a couple of weeks, and they could smell smoke on me that lingered. So yes, God will get your attention with a burning bush, especially when you're not expecting it. And who would be expecting that when it interrupts your otherwise ordinary day or night? Now, perhaps in the days of Moses, a burning bush wouldn't have been that unusual. There was no fire department. There were no fire bans during hot, dry days. There were no admonitions against playing with matches because there weren't any matches. And so perhaps Moses wouldn't have been as startled by seeing a burning bush as we might have been if we saw one pulling out of our garage and driving down Memorial Drive on the way to work. So God got Moses' attention not just for the fact that the bush was burning, but by a flame that did not consume the bush. If any of you at Christmas time ever used the, uh, maybe you've gone on Netflix and you can download the, the burning fireplace image so you can play it on your large screen TV and it looks like you've got a fire and you can hear the crackling of it. Well, it's sort of like that. The flame keeps burning. Obviously, your TV doesn't burn up. This bush kept burning, but it was like watching one of those videos. The bush itself did not burn up. That got Moses' attention. Now, this biblical story is known, of course, as the story of the burning bush. And it's one of those scriptures that it has made its way into the, the secular vernacular. You don't have to be a church person to, to recognize the phrase, a burning bush. And that's, of course, an obvious reference to this story because it gets our attention, just as God used it to get Moses' attention. But when God gets our attention, it's always for more than just flashy showmanship. We've heard that in the miracles of Jesus, that they would sit in awe. What are you going to do for us next? What have you done for us lately? And that was never the point of Jesus' miracles, to just show off. They led to a deeper truth, and so it is here with God. God is not a pyrotechnician merely for the sake of entertainment. So we sit here today hearing the story, and we, like Moses, turn to look at the burning bush that did not consume and say, why? 
I hope we say why. Sometimes I fear that we hear these stories so often, oh, this is the, this is the Sunday we hear the story of the burning bush, and the words fall off of us as if they are familiar and known, when in fact, they are remarkable. I have fond memories of being a kid and going on vacation, as I'm sure many of you do as well, either driving from Eau Claire the six hours down to Chicago to see my family or traveling up to Boy Scout camp in northern Wisconsin or visiting relatives who had a beautiful cabin on a lake near Eagle River, Wisconsin. After my dad died when I was six, my mom was the only driver in the family. Um, I couldn't do that for another 10 years. That's what the law said. So she drove, and, and, and yet she was a reluctant and uncomfortable driver. In fact, she had never had a driver's license until my dad died, so she was 32 when she learned how to drive. So she didn't enjoy it. We didn't dally on a road trip. If we left, the objective was to get to the destination as fast as possible without stopping and getting lost, and therefore it would unburden her from the task of having to drive a motor vehicle. So we went from origination to destination in a direct route. But I had friends who would talk about their family vacations growing up, and they couldn't travel 60 miles in less than four hours because Dad would pull over the station wagon at every historical marker along the way and pull into every scenic wayside. A road trip was a series of teaching moments. Here's a historic bridge named after a famous World War II hero. Here's an expansive vista of rocky hills. Do you understand the geological, geological history here of drumlins and glacial drift? And the kids just want to get to the pool. Moses was on a road trip. And for reasons we do not know, he led his flock, and at this point we're talking a literal flock of sheep, Later, we will talk about a flock of people, but he, he leads his flock beyond the wilderness to a mountain called Horeb. So this was an ancient road trip, but it was a working trip. He was caring for the sheep, and heretofore, Moses is a little-known figure in the Bible. He had that remarkable beginning that I alluded to, which you can read about in Exodus 2. But at this point, he was taking care of his father-in-law's livestock. So imagine he's running a family farm out in Janesville Township. This is, this is Moses' life at this point. He's doing good, solid work, nothing remarkable. Day after day for Moses, it's business as usual, as it is for many of us. Day after day, it's business as usual. And despite this remarkable childhood, he's now living a fairly sedentary life. He wakes to a cold sunrise. He greets his wife and children. He washes his face. He eats his meals. He says his prayers. He sleeps well. He puts one foot in front of the other, again, as many of us do from one day to the next. He was, in the words of Scripture, keeping the flock, because that's what a shepherd does. There's nothing flashy about keeping. It, it's maintenance. Ma maintenance is important. We know what it's like to, to maintain things to keep appointments, to keep an eye on the kids, to keep the budget, to keep up with technology and trends, to keep the peace among friends, to keep an eye on social media or the news. We know these things because it's what you do when you're a responsible adult, right? You keep in touch. It's maintenance. It's not bad. It's necessary. So we can read into this station of life that Moses is in. He is midlife, mid career, middle management, and stuck in the middle of nowhere. And maybe that resonates with you on some days, or some weeks, or some period of your life. Maybe you have a schedule to mind and to do. Maybe you have appointments to keep or a social life to uphold. Maybe you are at a place in your life where you are sandwiched between the needs of your children and the needs of your parents. Maybe you have obligations at work and at church or with a club or a charity that you try to balance each week. Maybe you have a house to fix, a lawn to mow, docks to put in or pull out. 
boats to tend in summer and snowblowers to test in fall. Maybe you have house payments, car payments, student loans. Maybe you have child care concerns. Maybe you feel like you are a chaperone or a taxi for all of the people in your life. Some days, it can all feel like doing maintenance, can't it? That's Midian. That's where Moses was stationed. He was in Midian. Think of it as a place in the middle. All of us wonder somewhere, sometimes, whether we are where we're supposed to be. Are you where you are supposed to be? I'd like to think that where we're supposed to be right now, in this moment, are you where you are supposed to be in your life? If you're wondering, this is a great scripture for that. We live one ordinary day after another. We maintain, and maintenance can be seductive. We can live rather comfortably without seeing anything beyond the next event on our calendar. We can be content living beneath the radar of other people's expectations. But then, by a force that we might call restlessness, sometimes boredom, or perhaps more accurately, by God's subtle but persistent call, we, like Moses, are prompted to get up off the couch. So the first shift in Moses' life is when he leads the flock beyond the wilderness to Mount Horeb. Not the one with trolls west of Madison. Mount Horeb, also known as Mount Sinai. It is the mountain of God. And this is a pivotal moment in Moses' life. Has your life come to a pivotal moment or several? Moses went from minding someone else's business to guiding his own flock. He transitioned from middle manager to a leader. He went from being a follower of sheep to a leader of God's people. And that's what leaders do. They move flocks to greener pastures, beside still waters, and into paths of righteousness. I was delighted for the bishop to appoint me as one of the pastors in this congregation 13 months ago, but there was no call to come and do maintenance. That would be easy. That would be work we all can do to rest on our glorious tradition as the Cargill Church. But our call is not to maintenance. That doesn't mean we, don't, we dispense with tradition. That means that we are called into greener pastures and into paths of righteousness. And where do you find those things? You don't find them in Midian when you are comfortable staying in the middle ground, but you find them out in the wilderness where amazing things happen. Some of us go to the wilderness voluntarily. Some of you tell me that you go up to the boundary waters or you go camping, and we voluntarily go into the wilderness. But you always know that you can circle the day you're probably coming back from that trip. The wilderness is to go forward, not entirely sure what date we're going to come back home. And that's why it said that the journey is more than just the destination. You've heard that. We don't set out only to find the things we seek. My mother did that when we departed Eau Claire for Chicago. We had one goal, and that was to get to the destination. But then we miss the experience of everything that happens along the way. That historical marker by the bridge that your dad took you 12 miles off the road to see when you were on your way to Wisconsin Dells. See, it's possible if you drive fast enough, if you live fast enough, if you fix your eyes firmly on your iPad, that you can speed past the Grand Canyon without knowing that it's there. God will get your attention with a burning bush or otherwise, but you can't see a burning bush at 70 miles an hour. Sometimes you have to put the car in park. 
Perhaps some of you are enjoying that rhythm. It is summer, after all. There is an allure that summer is a quieter time, a slower time, a time to relax, to rejuvenate, to travel, perhaps to take vacation. Perhaps some of you are already in the mode as you check the calendar and see it's August 8th today and oh my gosh, school starts in less than a month and how am I ever going to be ready and your heart rate starts to beat a little faster and your palms get a little bit sweaty and you think, oh my gosh, another summer is gone and how are we going to get ready and go back to whatever we're going back to and that's an additional anxiety for us now, isn't it? What are we going back to? But God encourages to live a life of a rhythm. A rhythm of both get up and go when it's time, like our youth have been rousted from their typical weekend routine and they have gotten up and gone this week. They've been here at 8 o'clock on Friday, Saturday, and this morning. There is a rhythm to this. I know that at weekend's end, they will be exhausted. If they aren't, I know that Pastor Song Min will be. But that's part of the rhythm. There's a rhythm of getting up and going, and there is a rhythm of stopping to smell the roses, as it were, of putting the car in park and asking, is God trying to get my attention? Seven years ago this summer, I first came to this church I was the pastor of another church, but I was blessed to come here. I've shared this story with you before as part of the Youth Rock one-week mission trip that was centered here at Cargill, and kids from all over the state came, and we, we stayed here and ate here and prayed and worshiped here for a week, and then every day we would go out and do missions, sort of like our, our youth are doing this weekend. And every evening we would do something socially with them, and one night we went down to the Janesville Ice Arena, and as we were getting ready to leave, there was a terrific thunderstorm, one of those summer blasters that comes through. And it didn't last long, but we waited it out. And we came out of the ice arena and looked up and there was these, these stunning clouds. And so I took out my iPhone and, and I, I simply took a photo of the sky above the, the ice arena before we came back to Cargill. And this was the photo I took. And, and not until later did I notice, in fact, it was Pastor Chris Didi who pointed it out. She said, wow, you got a great picture of that cross in the clouds. I hadn't even noticed it when I put my iPhone up to take the picture. And because of that moment, even the parking lot of the Janesville Ice Arena for me became holy ground. It wasn't magically transformed, but it was a place where God got my attention. You can make of the cross of the clouds for what you will. But it became a holy memory for me, and it's wrapped up in the youth that were there and the work that we did, and it is a marker of holy ground. Holy ground is that place where we encounter God and that we remember it. It is not defined by the parameters of this sanctuary. A sanctuary can be holy ground. But it isn't automatically holy ground unless we encounter God there. Mount Horeb can be holy ground, but only if we are willing to pull over and to see the burning bush and ask why. Why does this bush burn so? Then we are on holy ground. Midian is not holy ground. Maintenance is not our work. Holiness is beyond the next turn and over the next hill if we are willing to get up and go. And then, along the journey, we are willing to pull over, to look and listen and learn.
And now let us join together in our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Dear friends, now as we go into this day and into this week, may we be conscious and aware and drawn that we are on holy ground because every place presents the opportunity that God might encounter us along our journey. Go now in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.